Well, you can turn with me in your Bibles to the book of James, James chapter 5. If you received one of the Bibles that we handed out a few moments ago, it should be on page 180 on the right side of your Bible, James chapter 5. This morning, we're going to be finishing our study of the book of James, and as we have made our way through the book of James, we have seen how James has interwoven compassion and love and empathy and rich theology into his very direct instruction for these early Jewish Christians who have chosen to follow Christ and have done so at great cost. A great cost, which has caused them much earthly trouble. And James's evident, passionate concern is for the endurance and for the holiness of these early Christians in their faith. James really brings his concern to a climactic close in our section this morning as he ends the book. And this is somewhat a debated section of scripture. And this passage has been, by some, made to be more about healing and Uh, things like that, someone who has had physical sickness than anything else. And I want to draw attention this morning to the fact that this passage has to do with prayer. More than anything else, this passage has to do with prayer. And in order for us to see this passage properly, we must remember what James has just been talking about. In the first half of chapter 5, we saw last week the call to endure hardship with patience. To trust God in his dealing with the evil rich man. And though you may be unjustly dealt with, God will in the final day bring true justice to all. And in verse 8, James calls the believer to strengthen their heart in times of distress and trouble. Verse 11 of chapter 5, he says, we count those blessed who endured. He says, you have heard of the endurance of Job. Verse 12, don't let these trials of life tempt you in your speech to make foolish vows to depend on yourself in times of struggle and trouble. And now verse 13, what we see is the call to pray. And just look for a moment at our passage. Verse 13, pray. Verse 14, pray. 15, And the prayer, verse 16, and pray, verse 17, Elijah prayed, verse 18, then he prayed again. The passage we are looking at this morning is predominantly a passage about prayer. And James understands the span of challenges that the Christians are facing. And he cannot finish this letter without drawing clear attention to the place that prayer must have in their lives. Trials come to everyone. Hardship comes, and for these Christians, especially persecution and hardships and trials, and they need instruction on where to go for help in these times of trouble and distress. They need instruction on where to go when life's hardships press up against you. And turning to prayer, coming before the Lord in prayer is absolutely critical. We must understand God's intention. We must understand God's intention to use prayer to accomplish much in and for his people. There's a story in an article on prayer by John Anderson, and those of you who took Wellspring this last year have heard me share this in my lesson on prayer, and the story is told about a small town in the south. For many years, this town had been a a dry town in that no alcohol was ever sold or served there, but one day a businessman in the area decided to build a tavern, and in response to this new tavern... The group of Christians, a group of Christians from a local church became concerned and planned an all-night prayer party, uh, 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 an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. And shortly after the prayer meeting that night, lightning struck the bar and it burned it to the ground. And in the aftermath of the fire, the owner of the tavern sued the church claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible for his loss. Well, what did the church do? The church hired a lawyer to argue in court that they were not responsible. After the initial review, 
of the case, the presiding judge began the trial with an official statement. He said, no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear, the tavern owner believes in prayer and the Christians do not. (laughs) May it never be said of us that we do not believe in prayer. Let us look together at our passage and see what God's word says regarding prayer and the Christian. James 5, verses 13 through 20. We'll start in verse 13 and go all the way through the end of the book. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Verse 19, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for the richness of your word. Thank you for this precious book in our Bible that we can learn and see such helpful, protective, fortifying instruction for the believer. And I pray this morning as we work through these verses, I pray that you would give us clarity to see what is there, discernment to not read into it what is not there. And Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts, that we would be the kind of people that you desire us to be, that we would be strengthened and fortified in our faith, that we would faithfully endure to the end. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, James gives critical instructions so that the believer may faithfully endure while being fortified in prayer. That's what we really see in this passage. We see James give critical instruction for the believer so that they may faithfully endure while being fortified in prayer. The instruction primarily revolves around prayer, which what we see is that prayer will have a fortifying effect for the believer, aiding them so that they may endure, so that they may stay faithful, so that they may continue and press on to the end in the midst of life's trials and hardships and challenges and sins, temptations, and all the things that challenge us and and press for our affections in this life. We see James here as he closes out his book, gives specific instruction centered around prayer that the believer might be fortified in their faith. And that final instruction James gives is to aid and help the Christian endure in holiness and in fidelity to God so that they might remain faithful to the end. When their faith is pushed to various limits, that they would turn to prayer. And so the first critical instruction that James gives that we see in our passage is, number one, the call to pray in life's various circumstances. Pray in life's various circumstances. We see that in verse 13. In verse 13, James gives a contrast of circumstances. And the response to those circumstances and everything in between is communication with God. Look at verse 13. If you are suffering, pray. And if you are cheerful, sing praises, which in essence is worshipful prayer to God. This instruction isn't limited to a specific kind of believer, but this is for all believers. If anyone is suffering, and the suffering here is hardship, it's an experience of what is bad. It's a suffering misfortune or calamity. But the point here of the suffering is not so much the situation, but the spiritual burden that that suffering is bringing upon the believer. 
They're enduring evil treatment or difficult circumstances, and it's affecting them spiritually. And when you find yourself suffering in such a way, you are to pray. The call for this one is to pray. This one, when in difficult life circumstances and trials, when you are in trouble or suffering, each one of us must pray. The impulse of every believer must be to pit, petition God when in times of trouble. When in distress or turmoil, don't think first about how you might control the situation or get out of the situation. Go to the one who is in control of every situation. We're not to fall into self-pity or complaining, I don't deserve this. Or like what I do when I get moldy strawberries, why me? That'll make sense if you were here several sermons ago. How could this be happening? A grumbling response to terrible situations. We don't do that. We run to God. We run to God in those times of trouble. We turn to God when facing distress and emotional struggles, not complaining, not grumbling, not self-help practices, not yoga, not food, not sports, not hobbies, not relationships. When you're emotionally struggling with the hardships of life, the first place you should turn is to God in prayer. And your hope and prayer is not that God will just immediately change the situation. James has never set that forth as the hope, but to pray for strength and wisdom to endure, to respond to your life's circumstances in a manner that pleases your Savior, to be holy. I want us to just consider for a moment social media. Social media has given us so much unhelpful outlet, so much of an unhelpful outlet to wrong responses to difficult circumstances. When difficulty strikes, how easy is it to simply snap a photo and post for all to see our calamity, that they might mourn with us in our distress, in our hardship, in our trial, and not every post about what is going on in your life is a, an inappropriate post. But how easy is it to complain publicly when we should be petitioning privately before the Lord? The call from Scripture is to run to God. Is any among you suffering? He must pray. This is very similar to what James calls us to in chapter one. If you lack wisdom in the face of trials, if you're struggling to honor God and please him in the midst of hardships, Ask, ask for wisdom and he gives generously without reproach. If you're in trouble, pray. Seek God in your distress. He hears and he cares and he knows and he loves and he never leaves you or forsakes you regardless of how you feel in your distress. So pray. Pray. We trust, we depend on God, and the nature of this verb, he must pray, is one of a continual action. Pray and keep on praying. Continually look to God when you are struggling, when life is low and challenging, pray. But also, we see the call when you experience the highs of life. When you are cheerful, you must direct your attention to God in praise. We're called to pray in life's various circumstances, whether it's sorrow and hardship and suffering, we're to pray. And if we are cheerful, if we are joyful in that moment, we are to sing praises and to come before God. Look again at verse 13. James asks another question. Is anyone cheerful? He's to sing praises. And there's a contrast here, yet the instruction is very similar. Recognize God's presence. And go to him. The, the term cheerful or happy seems to demonstrate a contrasted emotional situation. This is one who is of good cheer. This is one who is of good uh, courage. In good spirits. This isn't a boisterous laughter, but an inner attitude of cheerfulness. This one is doing well. Yet there is a real temptation when trials are removed or when we are in pleasant situations to become self-reliant and self-dependent, to forget our need for God or to forget the presence of God in our circumstances. And so if you are cheerful, sing praises. And clearly this is to God. God. 
Let him sing songs of praise. This directs the believer's good feelings to where they should appropriately go, and that is to the Lord, that they would find expression in spiritual songs. God must be remembered in all circumstances. And this is a fortifying reality and instruction for the believer that we would remember God and go to him in prayer in all of life's various circumstances. God must be remembered in all situations. The valley of sorrow and the pinnacles of joy are both occasions to come before the sovereign God. One theologian said it this way, prayer is not only the desperate cry of the sufferer, but the joyful praise of the victor. In whatever circumstances you find yourself in, we are called to pray. We must remember God's presence and we must go to him. Whether it's a desperate pleading for help or joyful proclamation of thanksgiving. A way that the believer must be fortified in their faith is by a faithful life of prayer, recognizing God's presence in every circumstance. Next, the next critical instruction that we see is found in verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15, and the next critical instruction is this. Call the elders when you are weak. Call the elders when you are weak. This is a fortifying principle and instruction for those in the body of Christ. Call the elders when you are weak. What happens when a believer is going through a trial, when a believer is enduring hardship, when they are experiencing persecution and they can't do what chapter five, verse eight says in being patient and strengthening their own hearts. They're suffering like we saw in verse 13 and they can't bring themselves to pray. What does the Christian do when they are struggling in their faith, when they are weak, when they are faltering? What does the Christian do when they are not sure they can keep moving forward in their faith? Well, it's clear here, call for the elders. Call for help. Call the elders when you are weak. The elders are to be exemplary sheep in the body. They are to be the spiritual mature in the body. And so call for them. Call for the strong in the faith to come and to pray with you. Call for them to tend to you. Call for them to come and help bear your burdens. Similar to Galatians 6, if you're struggling in your faith, call for help. And the elders need to be on call, ready to come when that request happens. This passage has been commonly misunderstood, and so it's important we look at what James is getting at. And remember the context this passage is found in. Throughout the whole book of James, he has been helping believers endure hardship and trials that they are facing by helping them remain spiritually faithful to God in the midst of those trials. Even this chapter, we saw last week people who were being put to death by the unrighteous evil person. And James's instruction has never had anything to do with relieving primarily the physical hardships found in this life, but rather maintaining spiritual health and endurance in the midst of life's trials. So to see a shift here in these last verses of the book would be extremely inconsistent and un- unnatural. What James is clearly getting at is the continued spiritual care for those who are faltering in their faith in the hardships that they find themselves in. Now, I want you to look at something with me. Look down at verse 14. We see the word sick. Do you see that there? Is anyone among you sick? Okay, now look at verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Translators chose the same English word there. In the Greek, James uses two different words. One word for the usage of what we see as sick in verse 14, and then another Greek word in verse 15 that the translators translated uh, sick. The first word, is anyone among you sick, in verse 14, is used many times to refer to physical sickness. That's not a foreign concept that we see in Scripture. These references, though, to physical sickness are primarily found in the narratives, in in the Gospels and Acts. But it's also used frequently in the epistles to refer to emotional or spiritual weakness. 
And in the epistles, all but three are used this way, not of physical sickness, but of spiritual weakness. Now, to clarify what James is getting at, we can also look at verse 15, at the different word that is also translated sick. The word James uses here is only found one other time in the New Testament in Hebrews 12, 3, where it is clearly referring to the spiritually weak one. So regardless of how you view the first word sick, what James is saying is the calling of the elders is for the purpose that the one who is struggling might be restored spiritually within their faith. That's the thrust of what's going on here. That's the emphasis of the passage. So now let's look again at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? And I believe a better way of describing what James is saying is, is anyone among you weak? Spiritually so. And it's not separate from physical difficulty. We know they're enduring physical hardships. In fact, we see 15 alluding to that. But I believe what James is concerned with is the spiritual weakness that is brought on by circumstantial difficulty. Remember again, just a few verses before these, Christians are facing horrible treatment and persecution to the point of death. And for one of these extreme trials, in their faith, who then finds themselves spiritually weak, they must call for help. Verse 14, then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Those who are most spiritually mature must never give the impression that they are unavailable for those who are spiritually weak. When you are in physical difficulty and physically you are in difficult circumstances that are revealing a spiritual weakness in you, in those times when you can't again do what verse 8 calls to in strengthening your heart, when you are struggling to pray in your trouble and to draw near to God in your trouble, call the elders. Call us. Now, this isn't a call to call your elders and have them on speed dial every time something hard happens. You can just call SMED every time something hard happens. All right, and just in verse 13, those who are suffering are to pray. The impulse for the suffering one is to pray. So every time something hard happens, we aren't to think, oh, I need to to call for help. Where, Where our impulse should lie is to go to God first. But... If you find yourself not able to do that, if you are in distress and there is a weakness in your faith and you don't, you don't know what to pray, you don't know if you can go on, call the elders. Go to God first if you're struggling. We see in verse 16, confess your sins and pray for one another. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if you're suffering and weak in your faith and you can't strengthen your own heart, you can't in that moment pray. You don't know what to pray in that moment. Call us. Call us. And we need to have the wherewithal to ask for help, to have friends who will intervene on our behalf to go get help spiritually when we need it. The instruction for the week is to call the elders. But then we see the specific instruction for the elders. Look at verse 14. Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The direct command is that the elders are to pray for this one, which again draws attention to the reality that the thrust of this passage is the spiritual well-being of the person. The command is to pray over this weak one. But there is also the phrase, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the the word anoint can feel like a super spiritual word, which may muddy the water for us a little bit. It, It feels like a super spiritual word requiring some special ceremony, but really it means to smear or to sprinkle or to apply ointment. It also could be used to communicate a consecration, and this at times was a ceremonial practice, but in no way is this word exclusively bound to that. 
So here's what we're all gonna do. The next time your kids wanna go swimming, you can tell them that before they do so, you need to anoint them with sunscreen. See what they say. What we really see in the practice of anointing the weak one with oil, in this statement, we see a nearness to the weak by the elder. We see a nearness of the elders to the weak one. The spiritual weakness is not separate from the physical hardship that this one is enduring. In fact, physical hardships and trials are oftentimes when people are the most spiritually vulnerable. And let me give you a little bit of background into the times. They, they did not have advanced medical doctors at that time. They had doctors, but oftentimes the ways that they would treat wounds is they would take olive oil and they would rub the oil on the wounds. Similar to what Jesus talked about when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He wasn't a doctor, but in Jesus' story, he tended to the one who was robbed and beaten. The Samaritan tended to his wounds with oil and bandages, and this would help stimulate healing. Now, it may well have been that the early Christian who was being persecuted was spiritually weak following their physical persecution. And the elders would come and rub oil on their wounds as they prayed for them. And this is, this is so sweet. This, this passage isn't describing a circumstance where you've got these holier-than-thou people who have some special gifting that they can call upon and do a ritualistic ceremony to bring physical heart uh, healing to those who are, are hurting. This is a humble compassionate, spiritual, mature man in the church, an elder who is coming and is drawing near to a faltering sheep in their affliction. And he's not neglecting the reality of the physical hardship that this one has faced. He's not just simply reminding them of the sovereignty of God and their tragedy He's getting his hands dirty. He's tending to the physical wounds. This is a scene of compassion and humility and love and care that draws near to the hurting one where they are hurting, cares for them and intercedes for them. This is like one who can't take another step and that elder who's coming is not behind pushing them, but underneath them, putting them on his shoulders, stepping forward on their behalf. That's the scene here. Tend to their wounds in a manner that provides spiritual care and encouragement. There's a humble service here and tending to the one who is weak physically as they are bringing spiritual care. And James says the elders are to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, in Colossians, the believer is to do all things in the name of the Lord. So this isn't necessarily, again, some special act with the rubbing of oil, that, but rather the goal is spiritual encouragement, not physical only. That's what James is drawing attention to. Tend to their wounds in a manner that acknowledges and demonstrates dependence upon Christ. Come and tend to this person as a, a servant of Christ. And listen, an unbelieving doctor can anoint with oil. An unbelieving person can come and anoint with oil. They can smear oil on a person's wounds, but only a Christian can come and anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. And so there's to be a unique manner in the care for the physical ailments that addresses and is focused on the spiritual issue. Again, it's important to address and not overlook the physical needs, but the goal is the spiritual work of Christ in the person's heart. The direct command for the elder and the primary thrust of the instruction is for them to pray. And then James says in verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick or better understood, spiritually weary. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. The, the blessed result of this kind of care is that the weak one is restored. Restored. 
and will be raised up or awakened through the righteous man's prayer and encouragement. And James says, the prayer offered in faith uh, this isn't now, as we have more properly understood, verse 14, referring to any kind of faith healing movement James is starting. Rather, when the struggling weak believer can't pray or is struggling to believe God's faithful in their distress, the elder who is spiritually strong and does believe God's character despite life's hardships prays a prayer offered in faith. He believes God. And he believes God is pleased to use this protocol of care within the body to restore the one who is spiritually weak. The Lord will raise him up or awaken or arouse this one back to their faith. And if there are sins this weak one has committed in their spiritual distress, as God raises them up, they will be forgiven their sins. What a hope! Have you ever faltered in your faith, struggled in your faith, and sinned in your weakness? As you are restored in your walk with the Lord, there is forgiveness for you. What a, what a comfort. What a comfort. In your weakness, there's going to be a temptation to not think rightly. And one temptation that would not be thinking rightly is the temptation to think that, well, now I've blown it and I've sinned and I'm horrible and I'm a horrible Christian and there's no hope for me and to just remain in self-wallowing despair. But to know that in our weakness, if we have committed sins and we're restored, if we repent, there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness. So if you find yourself in hard circumstances and weak and struggling in the faith, please, please call. Call the elders. And just for a moment, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm gonna do it. With the elders in the room, just for a moment, stand up. There's more of us. This is many of us. You can sit down. If you don't have these men's phone number or know how to contact us, if you don't have my number, know how to contact me, uh, all of our emails are in the bulletin. All of our emails are on the website. If you don't know the men who just stood up, we want to know you desperately. We want to have relationships with you. We want you to know how to contact us. We want to be contactable by you. We want to know our flock. Elders, for, for us for a moment, we cannot, we cannot neglect this crucial ministry in the body of Christ. We need, we are called to go when there is a weak sheep and we need to be ready to endure the false alarms of the immature. We may have to sift through the spiritually immature who uh, on a false alarm call us and we need to care for them at those times for the sake of the truly spiritual week that we would be available and ready and near. We're to be available and accessible and responsive to the needs of those in the body. And then listen, Grace Bible Church, friends, if you find yourself simply wanting to hang out with the elders, we would love to. We want to do that. We do that. We want to fellowship with you. But please be gracious and patient with us. If we can't, simply hang out. We, we may not be able to because it's simply a season where there's just a lot of rescue missions. And if the option is hang out or go to the weak one who is faltering in their faith, we love you, but we're going to go to the weak one. We must. We're called to prioritize our time in such a manner. Much is at stake, as we'll see in the last verses of this chapter, we have to go. Eternity is at stake. Next, the next critical instruction 
for us to be fortified in our faith is this. Number three, confess sin and pray for one another. Confess sin and pray for one another. How can you guard yourself from getting to the point of the one who is spiritually weak that we just saw in the previous verses? What will be a great aid and protection fortifying you in your faith? We'll look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another. This is a specific telling to one another of the sins you are struggling with. And then a response that prays for each other. Do not be isolated in your battle against sin. Do not be isolated in your fellowship and in your interaction in the body of Christ. We need each other. And it's God's design that the confessing of sin and praying for one another is an aid to bringing about genuine repentance and restoration and to help maintain spiritual health and to produce spiritual growth. James says that you may be healed and the context makes, makes clear this is a spiritual healing. Peter uses this word similarly in 1 Peter chapter 2, 24, referring to the spiritual healing that comes from Christ's physical wounds. By his wounds, we are healed. And so confess and pray for one another so that you may be restored and remain healthy in the faith so that you don't get to that point of utter weakness where you can't step forward. We need to have people in our lives who we can confess our sins to and who can confess their sins to us and we pray for each other and God's design for spiritual wellness is that you are a part of a Christian community that does this. This confession uh, among believers is mutual and brotherly and we are commanded to do it. It's not a confess your sins when you feel comfortable or confess your sins when it fits within your season of life, or confess your sins when you are adequately convinced that the person with whom you are confiding in will handle that information the way that you demand them to? No. Confess your sins to one another, believers, and pray for one another. We trust God. This is his design. We can't always control what someone else does with knowledge of our sins. That's a vulnerable place to be. Yet we're called to confess and it's far better for our spiritual state to confess our sins and then trust God with how people steward that information than that we keep our sins unconfessed and unprayed over. And this is a confession that is open and full in acknowledgement of personal guilt. This is confession of specific sins, not only a confession that one is a sinner, sinner. This is body life of specific confession of sins. Among brothers and sisters in Christ, you confess to one another and you pray for each other. And God's means of bringing about sp spiritual maturity and genuine repentance is a humble transparency and confession received with compassionate prayer. The most fertile soil for sh spiritual shipwreck is a solitude Christian. The way we intentionally and consistently go after this instruction at Grace Bible Church is in our small groups. In fact, one of the things we discuss or one of the questions that we ask regularly in our gatherings together is, what sins are you struggling with? And we listen and we offer encouragement and then we pray. And this instruction isn't limited to just the elders. This is for all of us, those of you in student ministries who confess faith in Christ, you are called to pray and to confess your sins. And all of us are called to do this. All of us must do this. And if you're in a season of life where you cannot attend a small group, don't allow, uh, don't allow that obstacle to keep you from obedience to this command. You don't get an out simply because you're in a season where that's difficult. You still need to confess your sins and allow others to pray for you. And you need to make yourself available to hear from others and to pray for them. 
In fact, if you are neglecting obedience to this command, you are not only making yourself spiritual, spiritually vulnerable, but you're withholding from the church the opportunity for spiritual accountability and growth for all of us. It's one less person to have here and to confess with and to hear and to pray for. There's a communal a- aspect and impact to whether or not you're obedient to this command. This is critical for the spiritual health of the church. And let me just ask you a question for a moment as we consider this. When do you find yourself growing most spiritually discontent? When do you feel most lonely? When do you find criticism in your heart? When do you grumble the most? When do you find yourself struggling with envy or bitterness or becoming cynical? It is highly likely it's when you are separated from the body, not practicing this command. If you feel lonely, if you desire fellowship, if you're experiencing those things I just described, I I strongly encourage you to confess, Allow others to pray. Listen well to others. Be faithful to pray for them. Evaluate your proximity to the body. Are you serving? Are you praying? Are you being what God calls you to be to others? Or are you simply making in your heart demands of others? We must be a church who confesses sin and prays for one another. And we must be a church who is in each other's lives with a nearness so that this transpires and this takes place. A, a primary way that we do that is in small groups, but that's not what it's limited to. It's not that we only do this in small groups and it never happens. It needs to happen on Friday nights when we hang out and get together and when we have dinner together and we're talking about various things going on in our week and we say, oh, I was really struggling with this this week. And we say, oh, you know, I'd love to just pray for you. Would that be okay? This needs to just be normal body life for us. The spiritual health of our church will only increase as we do this more and more faithfully. What a helpful reminder. And I just want to say I'm so thankful for those in this church. So many of you are so faithful to this practice. And pray for me and ask me specific questions. And I've seen you pray for one another and ask each other specific questions and confess specific sins. And that is so good. Keep doing that. We cannot neglect this. Next, number four. Number four, remember prayer's power. Remember prayer's power. We see this in the second half of verse 16 through verse 18. There's no direct command in the second half of verse 16 through 18, yet implicit in the statement regarding the effectiveness of prayer is the call to remember this reality that prayer is powerful. It's effective. It it accomplishes things. Prayer matters. This is power in prayer, not because of some special conjuring of power that we possess that we can accomplish, but simply because God is powerful and he hears the prayers of his people. He cares. He listens. Look at the second half of verse 16. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The effective, or really what he's saying is the energetic prayer of a righteous man has power in petitioning the power of God to restore spiritually those who are struggling and faltering in their spiritual health. God is pleased to use the prayers of the spiritually healthy to bring restoration to the spiritually weak. And there's so much hope in this section when we realize this. Have have you ever felt someone was just too far gone? They're too far gone. They, they could never come back from this. They've strayed too far. I'm, I'm convinced they aren't even a believer. They are destined for judgment and hell. And yet there is so much hope to be found in the Lord. Pray. 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 
Pray for them. Don't stop. God may not choose to answer this plea, but we, don't, we, we do not know. And so don't stop praying. The prayers of a righteous man can accomplish much. Literally is very strong. The prayers of a spiritually healthy believer is a potent force in God using his power to restore the weak. Maybe you're the weak one this morning. Maybe you doubt God. Maybe you don't even know why you're here today. You just showed up and you're struggling in your faith. You're in doubt. You're unrestrained in rebellion against God. Maybe it's public or, or maybe it's private. Maybe you've been here for a long time putting on a show, but you know the inner workings of your heart. You know the rebellion that God sees, even though we may not see it yet. God, God can restore you. God can restore you. If you are breathing, you're not too far gone to be reconciled to God. James gives an example to help us remember prayer's power. Look at verses 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was highly esteemed by the Jews and definitely considered a righteous man, yet James brings him down to earth, recognizing he wasn't supernatural. He had a nature like ours. And this illustration is perfect. Israel was under the rule of Ahab and Jezebel and Israel was in a time of extreme rebellion and flagrant idolatry against God. The worship of false gods was rampant. You can just listen for a moment. 1 Kings 16, verses 30 through 33 say, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshiped him. Oh, this is a tongue twister. So he erected an altar before Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. It's not a good time for Israel. God apparently heard Elijah's prayer as Israel was spiritually depraved following their king. And then in chapter 18, God ends the drought in the land and the rain poured on the earth and it produced crops, setting a number of events in motion where the idols on Mount Carmel were destroyed and the prophets of Baal were killed. And the point of this illustration is that prayer has power. It's powerful. The spiritually healthy one's faithful prayer accomplish much. That doesn't mean God will do whatever we demand of him. Remember the instruction about prayer in chapter four? We can't ask with wrong motives. We ask humbly and dependently, remembering not my will be done, but yours. But we pray. We pray. And we remember prayer's power. And if we think rightly about prayer's power, why would, we, why would we turn to anything else first? We pray. Lastly, number five, critical instruction for us is pursue the one who strays. Pursue the one who strays. This isn't an out of place, abrupt ending to the book of James as some have suggested. It's a heartfelt capstone to the whole book full of compassion and hope and love. James has been seeking to fortify the believer in these verses leading up to this section so that they might endure and endure to the end faithfully. Faithfully. 
He's been talking about the critical role of prayer in this, and now he closes with this truth that we must know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. Pursue the believer who strays. Hopefully for each of us, it will never get to that point where we stray, but for some of us, it will. Some will stray. And James says in verse 19, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth. James says if, but that isn't an if of possibility, like it may or may not happen, but it's an if of instruction should it happen, it, it would be like me telling my wife, hey, if you go to the store, if you go to the grocery store, get more milk. There is absolutely no question in my mind that she will be going to the grocery store at some point in time. And if she happens to do that, get more milk. I'm not asking her because I don't know if she ever will go. It's going to happen and it's only a matter of time before she does. Well, here, some will stray from the truth. We've seen that in this body. And the call here is to pursue those who stray. The stakes are eternally high. And yet with the imminence that some will stray is the hope that they can be turned back. And oh, what a hope that is. Pursue because God may be pleased to restore James says, if one strays and another turns them back, it can happen, it will happen for some. And when it happens, here's what you must know and remember. James says in verse 19, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, what must we know? Verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. For the one straying from the truth who is restored, they are are saved from eternal death. That's hell. The path of the continuing in unrepentant sin, the one who continues in unrepentant sin is a path to death. It's a a path to demonstrating that you were a phony and a fraud and the whole time you were such things and that any hope of forgiveness of sins and eternity with Christ was a false hope like we saw in chapter two of James, not because of God, but because you have now demonstrated yourself to have that imposter faith, that false faith, that dead faith. You've demonstrated yourself to never have had a genuine relationship with God for those who continue in unrepentance. We must invite and remove every obstacle that we would have short accounts, that that we would hold fast to not only good Christian theology, but Christian living as well. It seems that we far too often distance ourselves from those who would bring spiritual concern or correction or admonishment regarding our Christian living. And in light of this, that doesn't make sense. Why would we ever want to put up barriers to being cared for that we might not stray Why would we ever want to put up obstacles to being approached? Sure, it may be hard. It it may allow for tough conversations and make for awkward circumstances when we're approached in ways that aren't our preferred manner of being approached, but some difficult conversations are far better than eternal damnation. And again, if we have to work through a bunch of false alarms of concern about our holiness so that the time when we actually are straying, we are rescued, oh, be approachable. Be humble. Be teachable. 
Recognize you don't see everything that you should. Allow others to speak into your life. Open up God's Bible with any person at any time who has a concern about what you think or how you are living in regards to God. We must invite short accounts. We must all be faithful to pursue the believer who strays. And we must have the humility to receive the input and admonishment of those pursuing us should we stray. Grace Bible Church, we have had circumstances in the last couple of years where you have had opportunity to do this. And what I have seen in you has been a faithful practice of diligently pursuing ones who have strayed from the truth. There has been diligent prayer, consistent phone calls, texts, emails, meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. We must all be faithful to pursue the one who strays in the ways that God has called us to. Eternity is at stake for that soul. With some, we haven't seen yet what we hope for, which is that they would turn. But we need to be ready with humility and forgiveness and joy to receive those that stray should God grant them repentance. Just think of Jesus' heart for this. The prodigal son returns, the father throws a party. There is joy of God in salvation and restoration. The lost sheep is found and everyone rejoices. The lost coin is found, everyone rejoices. We need to be constantly, constantly at any moment ready to receive back the one who turns from the air of their way. And if they are alive, there is still hope for reconciliation to the Lord and to his church, to this church. And I hope that should anyone who has strayed from the truth out of this church should ever listen to this sermon, that that they would know that we want nothing more than for them to repent and be restored to the Lord and to fellowship, deep, heartfelt, sweet fellowship here. I don't think a more vibrant, celebratory grill out could be had than one where we are celebrating the return of one who has turned from the air of their ways and who has been rescued from death and saved from the multitude of sins. Maybe we would do a grill out and sheet cake. (laughs) I think we should. A couple last questions to consider. Have you positioned yourself in the church And in consistent Christian fellowship where others would know if you strayed from the truth. Do do you ever grow faint-hearted in your prayers for those who have strayed from the truth? Don't. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep trusting that God will do exactly what is best for his glory and pray. Our great hope of being saved and our great hope of staying in Christ is Christ himself. We are completely and utterly dependent upon a power we don't possess on our own, but that now dwells within us. Prayer, prayer has to be a part of our lives as it is the expression of humble dependence and faith in God to be and to do all that he says he is for the believer. And so we consider trials joy, we fight temptation, we turn to God's word, we indiscriminately love, we pursue holiness of life, we are careful with our speech, we fight against worldliness, we endure hardship with patience, and we pray. Because as much as we might seek to do all of those other things, if we do not possess a power outside of ourselves, and one that is available within us because Christ is in us, we are hopeless. Yet in Christ, we have an eternal hope that cannot be shaken, it cannot be removed because he is faithful. He will keep us. The hope that we have is in God. Let's pray.
Father, we, we thank you that in life's hardship and trials, we can turn to you. That we are not asked to sustain ourselves apart from you. But that we can look to you knowing that you will keep us. You will hold us fast. And Lord, our Our plea is that those who have been in this body and have left this body as a result of straying from the truth, Lord, that you would, that you would restore them. That if they are truly yours, you would bring them back, that you would keep them and do what we know you do for your believers, which is not let them go. We know that all whom the Father has given to the Son, he has lost none, and so we have a great hope and confidence. And for those who have strayed from the truth and may have revealed themselves to have that imposter faith, we pray that you would grant to them genuine faith and that they would indeed be restored to this body and experience the hope, knowing the joy of being near to you, our gracious and great God. Father, help us to be a church who prays. Help us to be fortified in our prayer. Help us to be humble, to confess sins. Help us to be self-aware, to ask for help. Help us to be eager to go to the one in need. Eternity's at stake. And so we look to you and we pray. Now, Lord, as we reflect on the goodness of your care for us, we pray that we would have great cheer that would cause us to praise. And we want to do that together now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.